Great. Well, let's uh, let's get underway. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you're dining in from. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Dan Thomas, the Chief of Communications and Strategic Events at the United Nations Global Compact Office in New York. Um, welcome, everyone, to our business roundtable on advancing gender equality and women's leadership, where today we're going to discuss how to advance women's leadership and gender equality. This session is taking part of the UN Economic Commission for Africa's Regional Forum for Sustainable Development. And we thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity, uh, uh, giving us this space to bring in business leaders into these important discussions and to UN Women for partnering with us today. Besides inspiring experts from the UN Economic Commission for Europe, ITU and UN Women, and moderators from our UN Global Compact Networks in Portugal and Georgia, you'll be hearing from business leaders from seven other countries, Canada, Croatia, Denmark, Kyrgyzstan, Spain, Turkey, and the United Kingdom. And you can find their impressive bios on our website posted in the chat. I wanted to give special acknowledgement to our two male panelists today, as I fully believe that Gender equality is not just a women's issue. This is an every, everyone issue. And we need uh, male allies to speak up and champion gender equality. Thank you. Many of the companies presented today are signatories of the women's empowerment principles and have been participating in our Target Gender Equality Initiative. Uh, this accelerated program supports companies in setting and meeting ambitious targets for women's leadership. And I encourage everyone in the audience today to sign up to target gender equality, as well as to become a signatory of the WEX. Links will be posted in the chat throughout. Today, we're zooming in on traditionally male-dominated industries, as that's where progress can accelerate uh, for gender equality, but that often shy away from these gender equality discussions. To illustrate with an example, according to data from our recently released report, based on data from the WEPS gender analysis, gender gap analysis tool, only 39% of companies take proactive steps to recruit women in traditionally underrepresented roles. That's why this session will highlight good practices that can hopefully serve as in inspiration for many more to follow. And so without further ado, I'd now like to give the floor to Ms. Olga Algayerova, the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Europe and the organizer mm -hmm. of this Regional Forum for Sustainable Development. Over to you, Olga. Thank you, dear Dan, and a great introduction because I really liked how we were checking in uh participants from different places so and uh, seeing these different places is really getting to be uh, really the united nations uh, place here this world roundtable so thank you for doing that and it's my great honor and pleasure for me to open today's business roundtable uh, round roundtable sorry devoted to the promotion of women's leadership in selected industries as part of our regional forum on sustainable development that is uh, that we opened yesterday and uh, we are closing today here in Geneva uh, under the, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe for our region. The 2030 Agenda has reconfirmed the pivotal role of women as agents of change in all areas uh, of political, economic and social life and further developed the tools to promote the empowerment of women both in public and private sectors. Women are contributing to diverse workforce in business that has shown to foster creativity, innovation, increase productivity and efficiency. That comes to my mind, the, but much more. This role is crucial in times of crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has put a spotlight on the centrality of women's participation in all spheres of paid and unpaid work and has revealed crucial structural barriers to gender equality. The pre-existing gender inequalities in many countries have significantly deepened from ownership and labor force participation to payment, incomes and wealth, 
access to productive and financial resources. S sectors such as textile, accommodation, food services have been hit particularly hard. Women entrepreneurs mostly concentrated in micro SMEs and in hospitality industries experience more difficulties than men to survive the impacts of the pandemic. The progress in women-led businesses gained in the last decade is endangered. And it is essential for all of us to accelerate the action in support of women's full participation in the private sector. Today, uh, I would very shortly like to focus on three factors. First, we need to recognize gender inequality in all its forms, in private, public life, in wages and pensions, in paid and unpaid work, etc. We need to know how far we have gone on our path to gender equality and identify the structural barriers. Well, women are broadly un the underrepresented in the corporate world. The talent pipeline varies by industries and countries. Some Industries struggle to attract women at entry level, such as in technology. Others fail to advance women into middle management, such as the food or beverage sector, or senior leadership in the insurance sector. We need to know women's representation in industries by level and country to start with. We need to follow up with research and analysis of barriers to women's entry and career development. In many cases, we have only partial or late data, and studies are covering one or a few countries at best. We need timely and reliable sex disaggregated data and indicators to inform the decision makers and assess further policies and measures. So second, we need to commit to change and take immediate coordinated action at macro and micro levels through coherent uh, public and private policies. Third, we need to work together at all levels, community, country, region, global, and with all stakeholders, both male and female. Uh, finally, in UNECE, we contribute to all three areas through our normative and analytical work. We develop gender responsive standards, provide policy recommendations for, for closing gender gaps in the economic realm, and build capacity for women's entrepreneurship development. Our workshops for women entrepreneurs in Central Asia and the Caucasus provide skills, knowledge, practical tools to set up and expand women's active engagement in the economy. We also compile and disseminate data for evidence-based policy recommendations, including sex disaggregated data and gender indicators. So as we continue to work towards a better future for all, I'm deeply convinced that collaboration with the private sector can unlock opportunities and remove obstacles for women and girls to join and advance in their careers in all industries across our region and also beyond. We have a lot to learn from each other, and I look forward to today's exchange of experience. So thank you for your attention, and back to you, Dan. Thank you so much, Olga, for those opening remarks. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you, the Executive Secretary of the UN Economic Commission for Europe, the organizer of this regional forum for sustainable development. Thank you so much for joining us. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague from Portugal, Annabella Vaz Ribeiro, the Executive Director of the Global Compact Network in Portugal to moderate the first segment. Over to you, Annabella. Sorry, it seems I was muted. Thank you, Dan. Well, uh, we have, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And I think we have some, some cases that we can see. Um, we will see some good practices within this segment. Well, but just to start and to build in on what Olga said, well, we know that you represent companies that participated in target gender equality and uh, proud signatories of the web principles. But it's important to stress that the web tool 
is a great instrument to gender mainstreaming within the company. And this is um, our panel will be about that. And uh, um, I think that um, companies can access their performance and develop a work plan to advance gender equality within their operations and the value chain. And since 2017, we have had 2,682 companies using this tool. And this is also a way to support gender equality and the SDGs as it shows commitment to human rights, which is, of course, uh, within our uh, sphere of action. And Portugal has been one of the many countries implementing TGE. And what we have seen is that um, more than 90% of the companies participating in the accelerator have action plans on gender equality. And this is important because they can access their performance and then, of course, they can improve their action within the company. Uh, in the 2021 report, um, we can see that the average score for all users is 32%. And this shows that um, we still have a long way to go because we have only 4% of companies performing as leaders and only 17% of companies performing as achievers. And in this panel, we will address the workplace dimension of web related to uh, the equal opportunity policy, recruitment practices, uh, pender, uh, pay gap analysis, work-life balances, paid leaves. And this is important to see um, that this tool can help you really to understand in which areas um, companies still have some challenges, some challenges and how they can perform better in the future. And for this dimension specifically, the workplace dimension, companies achieve 37% as the average score and still in the improvement level. And of course, we want to take them to the advanced levels. So this shows us that we must double down our efforts to support companies in going all the way from the commitment phase to the implementation and the, the measurement stages so that they can, they can build on, on improving performance. So this is what we will have. We have uh, showcasing companies in, in the moment, but first I will give the floor to Ursula Weinhoven, the representative from ITU, the specialized agency for information and communication technology to keep us all connected. And now over to you, Ursula. Hello, Annabelle. Annabella, hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be with you. I'm actually doing this today from I'm late at night in Australia, where I'm on leave at the moment, but I couldn't um, let my um, holiday happen without doing this exciting event. So thanks so much for having me be part of it today. And what I plan to do is to share some insights from some work that we've done in the tech sector that may be also more broadly of interest to other sectors and corporate departments that are also male dominated. So firstly, there's clearly no silver bullet or easy solution in any sector to achieve gender equality. If there were, it would be done already. But precisely because it is hard, it's important to work at it. The tech sector, like other traditionally male-dominated industries, has been associated with stereotypes such as who is or can be a technologist, computer scientist, programmer, tech CEO, etc. And the same is often true of departments with these functions in companies in many sectors. And one interesting point to note about the tech sector is that when computers were first introduced, they were promoted as a good career option for women, with programming being marketed as an extension of typing or secretarial work, which women traditionally did. And there were higher numbers of women in the sector, including in academic studies. And some of you may have seen the movie Hidden Figures, which featured women who were computers playing an essential role in launching an astronaut into orbit. So we know that in the case of the tech sector, that it can be different because it was once different. And this underscores that we should be skeptical of accepting the status quo in any sector as just the way that things are. Second, no one company program or initiative 
however terrific it might be, is going to be able on its own to transform an organisation, enabling it to achieve gender parity. So we should manage our expectation and embrace systematic, holistic approaches. And this is actually a key value add of the women's empowerment principles in that it's a comprehensive set of actions and of the WEPS gender gap analysis tool that we're hearing about as well um, that helps self-assess progress to identify strengths and areas where further action can be taken. A third key insight relevant, I think, to every sector, but particularly in male-dominated industries or even departments, relates to organisational culture. Peter Drucker, a well-known management consultant, educator and author, famously said, the culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture might also eat policy for breakfast too. Another related observation is that people don't just quit companies or leaders, they quit organisational cultures. And companies in the tech sector and other male-dominated industries often have both a pipeline challenge but also a cultural challenge. And it might be harder to get women to join the team or company and they may also have a higher turnover rate once they join because of non-inclusive work cultures. And on the pipeline side, companies may need to look into new and different places and try different strategies to attract a more diverse pool of applicants. In the tech sector, for instance, there are a growing number of events, such as the annual Grace Hopper celebration that convene women in tech and that companies and recruiters can attend and do recruiting there. Women's universities can also be a great place to recruit, and some companies have programs that offer the opportunity to staff in other functional areas to build the needed skills to move into the more technical areas in the organisation. Proactive efforts are needed, including because some studies have shown that men tend to have more male contacts. In other words, there's unconscious bias even in address books. A common ratio in the United States, for instance, is that men tend to have approximately 80% male contacts in their you know, address books. On the flip side, existing female employees may be a good channel to reach other female applicants through their networks. On the, on the culture issue, it's important to realise that company or department culture may be experienced differently by different employees. If the culture works for them, it may not be obvious to male employees that the culture is not welcoming to women or other subsets of employees. It's, of course, important to have policies and strategies in place and what the CEO and senior management is on record as saying about the importance of gender equality is, of course, vital, but also critical as a complement to these organisational wide measures is the culture within which people are working and how welcoming, supportive and inclusive it is or isn't. We all have a role to play, actually, uh, in shaping that organisational culture. And our co-workers play an especially important role in how we experience our day-to-day -day work. So one thing to expect and to be ready to tackle, especially once you start making progress on gender equality, is some backlash. The UN Secretary General has highlighted the need to push back against the pushback in this context. And our work in this area has shown that key steps include things like having a clear statement of support from the organization's leadership on the strategic port, uh, importance of the actions and the benefit for all employees of a more inclusive work environment, having and communicating robust data that supports the need for the actions and making engaging men a priority in the organization's approach recognizing and rewarding inclusive behavior and holding people accountable for lack of progress. Stereotypes and backlash, um, myths, et cetera, can be confronted and dispelled with facts and data and enlisting powerful supportive men as allies for programs and to respond to the backlash is also really, really important. Um, another culture-related challenge that can arise is an overemphasis on seeking to fix women to fit and navigate the existing culture. For example, through training and mentorship programs, sometimes creating more hoops for women to have to jump through while leaving the existing non-inclusive culture intact. And this is not a recipe for sustainable change. Training and mentorship, of course, can be extremely valuable and um, ITU um, promotes such opportunities too, but programs should not be a substitute for making needed organisational change and diversity inclusion really need to be truly valued to create the impetus for, for such change. 
And we've certainly seen study after study have shown the value of diversity inclusion for productivity and innovation and, and other important um, benefits. Um, so I think I'll shortly wrap up. I just wanted to say one last thing, um, that collaboration finally is an absolutely critical part of making progress to address some of the systemic challenges and particularly in environments that have been traditionally male dominated where maybe there's more work to be to be done and such challenges like how to advance gender equality in these in these sectors so partnering with others is absolutely vital to make this sustainable change since no one organization or type of organization can address these challenges alone in the tech sector, for example, we have the Equals Global Partnership for Gender Equality in the Digital Age, which is dedicated to promoting gender balance in the tech sector by championing equality of access, skills development and career opportunities for women and men alike with promoting awareness, building political commitment, leveraging resources and knowledges, knowledge, et cetera. So um, all of the, the kinds of issues that I've talked about here um, we've been working on with other partners under the umbrella of this equals global partnership in the, in the digital age for gender equality, excuse me, in the digital age. And we've definitely found that collaboration and partnership is absolutely key when we're addressing these systemic issues. So I'll stop there and I will share with the organizers a, a little a longer, slightly longer version and also some um, key takeaways. Thanks again so much for the opportunity to, to be with you today on this important topic. Thank you, Ursula, for uh, your important input. I think you brought down a few issues that are quite relevant, and I think culture is one of them. Um, and I think this also relates to our um, discussion panel. So to kick us off in just 30 seconds each, because uh, we want to hear from all of you and you have different backgrounds and experiences, so this is quite important. Um, please provide us a short overview of your industry and your organization, and maybe one statistic um, of your female workforce, because you will belong to um, underrepresented sectors for women. So who wants to kick off? Who wants to start? I'm Julie. happy to, Annabella. Yeah. Hi, I'm Juliet Thompson. I'm the Executive Vice President for People at Menzies Aviation. We have over 27,000 colleagues globally operating in over 30 countries across the world. So in our sector, in the aviation sector in general, um, women are very un underrepresented. So a few facts for you. Only 5% of the world's airline pilots are women. 26% uh, of air traffic controllers, 18% of flight dispatchers, and less than 9% of aerospace engineers. So the sector has a long way to go and our, our company is no exception to that. Okay, thank you, Juliet. <laughs> we have to change those numbers, definitely, right? <laughs> Pascal, maybe? Yes, hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. So I work for CAE. We're a global high-tech company. We're the leader in training for civil aviation, defense and security, and healthcare. And so basically everything we do is about making the world safer. So the majority, for instance, of the world's pilots are trained by us, either by a simulator that we developed or in one of our training centers. And we have uh, 13,000 employees. Uh, most of them are engineers, pilots, or technical, and uh, only 22% so one in five are women. Yeah. <laughs> Still a long way to go, definitely. Ezra, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I guess Ursula used at least 50 times the word culture. Yes. I'm the people and culture officer of Hepsi Burada. Uh, Hepsi Burada is a leading e-commerce company, a large-scale online shopping platform with Super App Vision, leading the digitalization of commerce in Turkey. Uh, actually, uh, we are mainly a technology company, and also we are listed in NASDAQ since last July. We are the first Turkish company uh, that uh, existing in NASDAQ. So we can say that our industry is technology and e-commerce, uh, which we have also very huge operations and supply chain network. 
uh, actually and from women's perspective if we are on a in industry that we have scarce of scarce of resources from women perspective actually globally on technology industry uh, the percentage of women existence is between 15 to 20 percent uh, I will mention about Hepsi Burada numbers, which we are proud of later on. Okay, thank you very much, Ezra. Thomas? Yeah, sorry, I just need to unmute. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Thomas. Uh, I'm the um, head of people um, and basically also sustainability and a few other areas and mm -hmm. working with a company that's doing within the energy sector. It's called Simco Maritime. We are also uh, globally present, uh, but we are only 1,800. And I heard that one of my fellow colleagues, uh, 2,700. So we are not that many, but um, <laughs> we are definitely within a very uh, male dominated world within the yeah. engineering sector, right? Um, so to give you just a few numbers, um, we're looking into an industry where uh, if you look across around 15% of the employers, employees are, are women. Um, a lot of technicians, of course, engineers, but also people with a machinery, uh, electrician or mechanical background. Um, if we look into um, how we are structured, we are around 25% females in our leadership position, which we are not too, uh, uh, let's say, we, we, we are working on that as, as well, but it's actually pretty good compared to the market where we are, we are looking at our total yeah. Uh, workforce is around 15% female, uh, which um, which I'm actually um, having a bit of a challenge with when we come to the more senior management position because I need I think we need to divide this uh, discussion also into that. So if you look at our executive team, which I'm part of, we are only men. If you look at our board of directors, we are only men, and mm -hmm. uh, that's also why I'm uh, participating here in how we can build up that pipeline, right? Yes, thank you, Thomas. I think that's one of the challenges to build up on the pipeline, yeah, because then you have a problem for senior positions. Natasha, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Natasha Malik, and I work for Croatian Telecom, which is a leading telecom in Croatia, uh, at the forefront of digitization in the country. Uh, currently, we are employing about 40% of the women in the company, not just colleagues from the technical department, I myself come from the technical department, but in general, 40% uh, in all different uh, areas within the company coming to marketing, law, uh, economy, and so on. But if we talk about ICT business uh, that uh, we are talking about in general here, uh, in Croatia today, we have about 20% of all the jobs graduated by the girls. 18% of all ICT jobs in Croatia are done by, the, by women, which is a super improvement from the age when I studied some 25 years ago when it was 6%. So definitely a progress, but we can do much better, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Hazel, please. Hello everyone, my name is Ashir and I'm representing a local organization led by young women uh, to economic empower women in Kyrgyzstan. Our organization uh, works to support and uh, assist women to start business and lead it sustainably, uh, uh, despite all barriers that they have. And unfortunately today we have a, a big amount of uh, barriers uh, uh, women have faced uh, during their entrepreneurship. So data says that uh, according to national statistic uh, data, for 2020, only 34.4 percent of women were self-employed uh, compared to men uh, at uh, 65 and 0.6 uh, percent. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And now, David, construction is also a challenge, I believe. Hi, my name is David. I am the communication director to FCC. Uh, thank you for in, inviting uh, FCC in, in this event, in this panel, which uh, is essential for us. FCC is an international infrastructure and design and construction company. It's very curious because uh, we are the third co construction company in Spain. We work to Santiago Barranquilla Stadium, for example. Uh, the third 
uh, in Europe and uh, certified in the, in the world. Uh, in this sector, uh, the female workforce uh, is not very important, and uh, it is the challenge, challenge that we must uh, overcome. It's very, very important work all the companies in, in the sector to, to, to in, incorporate the, the women the, the, the woman, uh, workforce in, in the sector. Uh, nowadays, uh, approximately, uh, approximately uh, the radius is the 20 or 20 percent of presence uh, of the woman in the in the sector. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, David. Um, I would use the opportunity just to ask you that. Um, well, you have been signing the the women empowerment principles for over 10 years. So you, your company was one of the first signatories. And um, how do you think this was helpful for your company? Where do you think you had the most progress? Thinking, yeah. of course, about the workplace dimension. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, FCC uh, has recently completed the, the second target handle uh, program. For us, it's very important. Uh, begin the, the first and only Spanish construction company to participate and complete this program. Okay. We have been a pioneer uh, company in the development of equality plans in the, in the company. We have uh, led the change and we have allowed real equality to exist. For a few years ago, uh, we carried uh, carry out the, the following uh, action. Make to make the work of, of women uh, visible in the, all the company's activities. We mm. have in, in increased the, the, the inclusive of the, of the woman of women in, in different programs developed by the company. We have opted for the training and information in the company under criteria of equality, of course, we have established uh, equal measures in the different company uh, awareness action. All the measures have a, a strong impact on uh, our stakeholders, obviously. Of course. Uh, there is still a, a, a lot to do and, and the biggest challenge, uh, ch ch challenge sorry, with, um, with, for example, Continue making this, uh, visible the role of the of the woman in the work environment. Continue raising the, the awareness about the activities women develop in the company. Um, we work the the constant the, the constant fight um, to discrimination in different labor groups. Incorporate the women uh, in the in the roles in the in the selection of candidates. Um, working in 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 equal opportunities in in the selection to the different jobs. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and is is very important. Uh, implement the measures to promote the professional career of women with uh, with the 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 bones of FCC. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you so much for sharing those, that information with us. And now, please, back to Natasha. Uh, I would ask you the same. Well, you, are, you have signed the, the, the web principles over a decade ago also. And uh, what do you think was um, the areas of most progress? And what are your key challenges, challenges for the future? So in general, uh, we are promoting diversity in all aspects. So we have uh, employees coming from different countries all over the world and we successfully integrated them in our company uh, because we believe the strength comes from the more the merrier, you know, everybody comes with a new idea. But what we are especially proud of is the initiative 30% uh, where we achieved that 40% uh, of all our managerial positions in the company are done by women. So 44% well. uh, on the supervisory board. Uh, we have um, two board members uh, covering the entire residential segment, uh, covering uh, business and ICT segment. Uh, in technology, three out of seven directors are women. So 
uh, definitely uh, what where we succeeded is that there are no limits if uh, you are a female or a male if you know your job uh, you can achieve even the highest uh, positions in the company uh, right now maybe the largest challenge is to attract uh, uh, young uh, girls coming from the mm. ICT area the telecom in general uh, there are many IT companies which are maybe more attractive but we are continuing pushing because, like I said, uh, the, the more different views, the more different ideas uh, it enriches us as a company, we will definitely continue to push in, in the direction that uh, it doesn't matter which sex you are, that if you know how to do your job, uh, you will be successful. Okay, congratulations on those numbers. They are really, 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 really good. And now, um, Ezra, please. Well, you have joined recently to, to WEP. Well, you are a, a, a new signatory, let's say. And um, we have been living troubled times. So what was your encouragement to double down on gender equality during these times of crisis? Thank you, Annabella. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, this structure is on the core values of Hepsiburada since its foundation. Okay. Actually, we, as a firm believer in women's empowerment, we are proud and thrilled to have signed the VPs. Uh, Hepsiburada was founded nearly 22 years ago on the belief that women's participation in the workforce and empowerment in commerce actually are necessary for sustainable economic growth, not only for the company, for the country, actually. This is what we believe. So, and as we enter the post-pandemic economic recovery stage, it is even more imperative that women are central to restoring economic growth. Um, as for the ratio of female employees in Hepsiburada, we can say nearly half of the employees of Hepsiburada are women. Uh, it's the ratio, the exact percentage is 49.5 uh, actually. And especially our founder, chairwoman, is a woman, is an entrepreneur woman, Hansa De Doan, and as well as her, our, we have many managers and engineers. Actually, all in all, when we mention about technology industry, I told you the global number at the beginning of my speech, but in yeah. Hepsiburada, women make up 35% of our engineers. So we have still way to go, but while creating new jobs, we are also trying to create a gender ratio imbalance. I mean, to that favors women actually to support women's participation in the workforce. And we believe that doing so is crucial so that the success of fast growing technology group such as ourselves. And since its establishment, Hepsiburada has not strayed uh, actually from this path. And as the business grows, we have continued to increase the support for women, not only from employee perspective, but the ecosystem perspective. I mean, supporting entrepreneurs and women's uh, existence in e-commerce and digitalizing that commerce activities in Turkey uh, was very critical for us. And we have created specific programs that, will, that I will mention later on. Uh, to support women entrepreneurs on e-commerce, specifically focusing on their existence. And we have many, many good results that we are proud of, actually. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ezra. You have good numbers, <laughs> truly. And now um, I would go to Thomas, please. Um, can you share with us some ambitious targets and plans that you have developed for this area? of course, within the workplace dimension. Sure, I would be happy to. Uh, first of all, congratulations to my fellow colleagues. Uh, I'm doing a great job on, 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 the, on the topic. Um, that's actually the reason why we are joining in, um, because we still are, uh, I would say, not there yet. Uh, and uh, some of the things that we're doing right now to, to overcome, because now I'm hearing numbers that is actually equal, right? Um, and which we, when we're looking into our, um, organization as i said in the beginning it's uh, we have 15 percent in total of female and we mm -hmm. have a 
just crossed the 24.5% for female leaders. I was just checking them when we were talking just now. So actually, if we look at the leaders that we brought on this year, uh, the ratio has been 66% female, um, which is uh, it's at least trying to, to get the right uh, direction, right? What we're doing internally to promote a bit uh, like how we can do it um, inside our organization. Uh, first of all, we have, uh, we have seen in the past that uh, having not very clear career paths or uh, understanding of how you are promoted within the organization has favored the, let's say in the male a bit more. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you, can, you can talk about nepotism, you can talk about a uh, network, gentleman network. Um, so we are being extremely uh, transparent about each position and how you can actually uh, apply for it. And also making sure that we have a, a, a very thorough process where we actually don't reveal uh, the gender uh, until we are a bit later into the process. Uh, simply just to also remove a bit of that, um, um, that speculation. We have also uh, developed specific uh, specialist programs, I would say, that are uh, ensuring that we have half of, uh, half of each, um, mm -hmm. uh, men and female. Uh, normally, we would uh, look more for skills, capabilities, uh, geographics, uh, so forth. But that has actually been uh, equally important for us to make sure that we also have that. Then we have just recently kicked off an advisory board uh for uh, let us look into the gender inequality and okay. and that board is basically it, it uh, is is kind of my uh, let's say proof or sound uh spying partner for everything we do in hr that that makes sense so we have invited uh, i think it's uh, 11 female um uh, employees across our geographics to be uh, testing, basically, whenever we come with something that has been decided or been uh, um, forward from the executive mm -hmm. management team or within my team, the HR, uh, we actually do a, 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 a open-ended discussion with, the, with this team. It's newly founded, so I cannot uh, explain a lot of the experiences so far, but I'm looking very much forward to that. Um, okay. And then... Finally, I just want to say that then we are also going into a, a more, uh, let's say, external uh, collaboration with the uh, companies in um, where we are located, where we are looking to support whenever there's a spouse who's looking for a position, which is uh, quite often the case. Uh, then we will actually be uh, having a dialogue with the, with the individual to see if we can uh, put forward a position. And we're doing that as a kind of a combination between uh, other organizations that are uh, also here. So. Um, those are a few of the elements we're working on. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. Well, I would like to ask the same question to Pascal and Juliet. So keep it short, please, because you have four minutes. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so diversity, equity, and inclusion is um, you know one of our main priorities at CAE, and gender was the first objective because, uh, as I mentioned, the female ratio is, is low at 22%. Um, first, one of the first things we did is to, to, to you know, explain the importance of, of doing it, that having a diverse organization will help, not, you know, not only, not only is it the good thing to do, but it's also good for performance, good for decision-making. It creates a culture where everyone is valued, respected. So the first thing we did was we made commitments to increase the number of women at all levels um, uh, and in senior, um, in senior positions. So we wanted to go from being like a, a pyramid to a cylinder. What I mean is we wanted to increase, uh, we said we have to increase the number of employees at the staff level, of, of female employees at the staff level by 10% by certain dates, so uh, end of fiscal year 23 and increase the number of uh, uh, leadership even more, uh, you know, uh, bigger percentages. So for instance, we, we set objectives, uh, ensure that uh, by 2022, 30% of our senior executive leaders are women, 30% uh, of our board members are women, 30% uh, of the employees who are high potential um, are women, etc. co-ops, same yeah. thing. And um, how did we do, how are we doing this? One of the things obviously is resumes coming in, ensuring that 40% of the resumes are, are uh, from women that, that we receive from um, our HR team. We make sure that recruiters, you know, give us a balanced slate 
uh, with, you know, candidates from women, etc. cetera. So. Um, uh, That's the hardest part, maybe. <laughs> yes. It, or one of the easy. hardest, one of the hardest. Yeah, I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Juliet, can you share with us a few topics, please? A few goals? Yes, of course, I'm there. So um, for us, we're focusing on trying to have 25% of our senior leaders as female by 2025. And that aligns to many of our airline customers' targets who, who are working with IATA on, on similar goals. For us, attracting people into the aviation sector post-pandemic is a challenge um, anyway, regardless of gender. So a big focus for us is trying to make sure that we're um, promoting female talent from within the organization and helping our female um, our great female colleagues to accelerate their careers. So our talent management process involves a diversity lens, making sure that we're looking at up and coming future female leaders. We've launched a female leadership program within the organization to try and, as I say, help to accelerate some of their career progression. Um, and we're working in partnership with many of our senior um, male colleagues to try and help them champion and mentor some of our, our great female potential future leaders within the organization. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and I think we are back to Dan. Thank you very much for all your sharings. Uh, I think we got a good sense of what kind of practices that you have. And um, we hope that the women empowerment principles can help you. And of course, the target gender equality also. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for a great session. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our colleague uh, from Georgia, Salome, to run the next panel. Over to you, Salome. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Annabella, for, for this opportunity to participate in this, in this very important discussions. Uh, so many interesting topics were raised, actually, and um, it's very exciting to hear how the companies across the regions are uh, taking steps to empower women at the workplace. And uh, now I'm honored to moderate uh, also a very important discussion about uh, empowering women in the marketplace. Uh, and uh, the marketplace dimension is a very important dimension uh, that ensures that uh, the marketplace practices by the companies, including the practices in the supply chain, um, development of women entrepreneurs, and including them into the supply chain, uh, is uh, well um, integrated into the operations of the companies and their policies. Uh, principle five, which is dedicated to enterprise development, supply chain, um, and the marketing pract uh, practices in general, uh, encourages business to uh, require their partners, their contractors, and suppliers to also adopt women's empowerment principles. Uh, it also requires, among other areas, to establish supplier diversity programs that uh, uh, actively seek to expand business business relationships with women-owned businesses. Uh, another important dimension of principle five that we are promoting with the business sector is to remove gender-based stereotypes in all media advertising and systematically depict women and men as empowered actors with progressive, intelligent, and multi-dimensional personalities. Uh, analysis that we carried out um, uh, of uh, website network companies that actually completed the web self-assessment tool show that the marketplace average score of businesses is actually the lowest uh, compared to other dimensions of uh, uh, women's empowerment principles such as the workplace, uh, the community dimension and also the leadership. So out of uh, two, more than 2,500 companies that actually took the tool and completed the tool, uh, which represent 117 countries, 
in 2021, 30% have a responsible, say that they have a responsible marketing policy. 12% have a robust due diligence and um, assessment processes for suppliers. And 9% include gender specific questions in supplier self assessment tools. 8% track percentage spending with women owned businesses compared with 4% which was in 2020. So we can see uh, the increase uh, of companies that actually include women-owned businesses um, in, in their supply chain. Uh, and also 5% of the companies report publicly on percentage spending with women-owned businesses. These statistics are um, still low, and I think we, we need to work further to improve those. And... Um, in 2016, I remember when uh, the self-assessment tool was being produced, uh, the Georgia Network was one of the first ones to actually pilot the tool with the companies and help the companies to adopt the action plans. I clearly remember that uh, the marketplace dimension was one that companies had most challenges with. And... Uh, but they could also see the opportunities for further development. So very interesting discussion ahead. Before we continue, uh, I would like to pass the floor to our keynote speaker, Aldiana Sisic, uh, Chief of Multi-Stakeholder Partnerships and Advisory Services at the UN Women. Um, she will deliver a keynote speech around business case for including women entrepreneurs into the supply chain. UN Women is our major partner in, uh, uh, in promoting women's empowerment principles in business sector. So Aldiana, thank you so much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Salom, and thank you for inviting me and for giving us opportunity to speak at this event at a, at a really key and crucial moment that we need to discuss the role of, you and, uh, role of women and, and uh, entrepreneurship. So uh, I want to also congratulate you and GC colleagues for organizing this discussion. And needless to say, how greatly we value uh, your support, all of your support to the gender <laughs> equality agenda of the private sector, as well as our really uh, good and solid partnership in this, uh, uh, on this matter. So I'm really delighted to hear today, not really, so, I mean, I, I opted not really for key note speech in a traditional UN terms, but just to kick off the uh, discussion uh, in this market plenary session and give some food for thought uh, as we go uh, further. So as you already also talked about tackling stereotypes, marketing, uh, pra marketing practices, including language and uh, uh, et cetera, I would like to focus more on the role and opportunities that businesses have in advancing gender equality and particularly through their suppliers by supporting women's businesses. And perhaps to outline really two key points. The one is the, the starting point for us in UN Women is that we consider that supporting women's entrepreneurship agenda is of vital importance, not only from the perspective of women's human rights and gender equality perspective, but also from economic perspective, um, as it directly contributes to countries' economic growth. And, uh, um, um, and, and this discussion is, I think, more important and timely than ever now after the COVID and with all that we see that is happening around the world. And secondly, just want to give you an overview, very brief overview of a few tools you and women has developed globally and in the region uh, together with our partners. So women's entrepreneurship, as I said, is one of the key drivers for economic growth and sustainability. I think that is kind of a non, non to open for discussion anymore. That, that's the point that we all agree and then we all can uh, we all see. So through employment generation and boosting innovation growth, uh, these businesses can provide income for their families, employment for their communities, and as well as create new value to product and services. So women have been also really fast growing segment um, of small business ownership for decades now, for several decades. In developing countries, we have, seen, we have about 10 million small and medium enterprises, with at least one woman owner. And for example, here, in, I'm based in the United States right now. So in the United States, 
<clears throat> women-owned businesses are growing at more than double rate of other, all other firms. They contribute nearly three trillion to the economy of USA and are directly responsible for 23 million of jobs. So that goes back to my point about this is the fact now that you, you know that women-owned businesses are contributing to the economy and the growth and employment, et cetera, et cetera. For the last two years, unfortunately, due to the COVID, of course, we have seen large setbacks uh, uh, into the uh, women-owned businesses. So globally, about six points, uh, six percent points more likely women-owned businesses are to close their businesses than male-owned businesses. Also, women entrepreneurs are more likely to take on childcare, homeschooling, domestic responsibilities than male entrepreneurs. And that is having significant impact, of course, on their productivity, stress level, health, uh, and the business itself. So as I said, human, human woman role um, has, a, has, has a big role and, and has an important role to play in supporting women entrepreneurs ecosystem. Um, and it is one of our key strategic areas uh, for all the reasons I've, I mentioned about. And also we have several initiatives supporting women's entrepreneurship at the global and the regional level. So one of these is called Women's Entrepreneurship Accelerator, or as we call it for the uh, with abbreviation, VIA. And this initiative uh, was built together by UN Women, ILO, ITC, ITU, UNGC, and UNDP. And it aims to establish really and strengthen um, enabling global ecosystem for women entrepreneurs uh, you know, in every country in the world. And there are many different components in this initiatives. The UN Women contributes directly to the gender responsive procurement line of work uh, and in very close partnerships with our host today with the UNGC. So in this line of work, we focus on two areas if you want. So that's one of the, it's a global level where we promote gender responsive procurement in the private sector through a community of practice where we have about 350 stakeholders. And uh, I'm delighted to let you know that uh, we just launched a uh, launch report, Procurement Strategic Value in close collaboration, as Saloma knows, with you on Global Contact, Compact. Uh, and uh, that is a report that is kind of the basis of our work, if you, if you want. Uh, it looks at the business cases the, you know, goes back to my point about economic value of, uh, of encouraging development of the women's entrepreneurship eco ecosystem because this speaks about the business case for companies to carry out gender responsive procurement. And then at the regional level, our office in, UN, uh, in Europe and Central Asia really is taking <clears throat> kind of wholesome approach to gender responsive procurement. And that's where we try to fill the gaps in the ecosystem after identifying the needs of both women entrepreneurs as well as the private sector companies. And then developing an innovative training program that will be launched this month and that will assist companies to adopt gender inclusive supply chain. And I'm very happy to add that we're also working with investors to increase their own gender awareness and increase motivation to invest into the women's own businesses. One of the examples of our work in that, in last year, our office in um, uh, ECA region has organized, a, which I think is really actually cool as well, is organized the first annual Women's Entrepreneurship Expo, which brought together women entrepreneurs from across the region, together with private sector companies, business leaders, investors, and experts. I've just been actually recently at Expo in Dubai, and I have heard, met many women entrepreneurs and I spoke with them there. I've spoke with those who have lost the businesses during the COVID. And they told me that their key problem is the contacts and networking. And it's not so easy to, to jump back in to raising your business when you lose your contacts, your business, your, your funds. So this, this kind of opportunities, when we bring together and create those networking opportunities, when we present the private sector, these opportunities that they can meet people face to face and see, I think are the, are the crucial value. You know, we speak about the partnerships, but these are sort of uh, um, very specific that private sector can do together in the multi-stakeholder partnership uh, uh, environment. So building on this experience and lessons learned, this year, UN Women Regional Office is also hosting second 
expo. So I really encourage you, uh, it's going to be focused on the value chain on inclusion of the women in the value chain. So I encourage you all, if you're interested to reach out to us to see how you can participate with us and, and, and our colleagues and, and um, uh, I, it's, it's in Istanbul, so just so you know. So I'm going to finish here because I know there's more time needed for the panel. And I just want to thank you again for, you know, for letting me participate and giving us the floor here. And I really look forward to continuing conversation beyond this meeting and working with all of our current and the new partners. So thanks a lot and back to you, Salome. Aliana, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, keynote speech and all of the information that you provided, the statistics, which are very important to be aware of where we stand right now and the tools that you have talked about, uh, the accelerator tools to enable women ecosystems and women entrepreneurs, gender responsive procurement, which is one of the crucial topics that we need to promote with the business sector, with the big companies in order to include women entrepreneurs into the supply chain of the companies and the in working with in investors uh, really important and crucial to increase their gender awareness and to uh, make to, to encourage them to invest in the women-owned businesses so thank you so much for all of your work and we will continue to cooperate in the future years to promote webs with the companies um, now I would like to turn to our distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, they represent different sectors uh, across the countries, the regions, and I think that this diversity is very interesting for our discussions because it makes it more um, uh, real to, to see also how uh, different regions and uh, different sectors and companies in those regions are actually adopting uh, uh, the women's empowerment principles and the principle five specifically, uh, and and what what are the results that we uh, are uh, we have achieved already and what we can achieve in the future. So I would like to start to, uh, with the first question and turn the floor to Asel. Um, I would like to ask you what do you think are are the biggest challenges that women entrepreneurs face, and what can or should businesses of all sizes do to tackle that? So I, I would like to ask you to uh, take around one minute to answer this question. I know it's very small time, but uh, in order to make the discussion more, more dynamic. Thank you, Salona. I will try to be short as possible, but uh, before answering to your question, I just want to compliment that uh, uh, Adjana mentioned that it's very important today to recognize uh, the value uh, of women's entrepreneurship in the uh, in the country and in the world at all. And for this case, I just want to share that today in Central Asia, in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan, uh, yeah, the national women's business agenda is developing, which is led by women's business associations with the valuable contribution and involvement of all other stakeholders. And uh, also in this process, uh, local companies are also involved. And I think it's very important to continue this, this work. Just complementing that Aldijana mentioned. And uh, talking about the barriers, actually we have a lot of barriers still, but I want to more focus on the barriers that came up. Uh, and I want to highlight after the COVID um, uh, period. So we see that after COVID period, actually most of the companies uh, continue their work on remote base. And uh, on this case, we see that a lot of women lost jobs and some of them had to close their enterprises. That came up with several reasons and barriers that we need to focus on. The first, we see that uh, in Currently, most of women double and tripled by uh, by house uh, work, uh, this, and they don't have enough time even to uh, to not to just start, but to rehabilitate their enterprises. The second thing is uh, about the uh, skills and. Um, capacity in digital. So today, a lot of companies are integrating new tools and using new ways of working, but most of the women uh, for my organization uh, priority work with women from rural areas. So women in rural areas, they're not ready for this. And I think today is very important to move to focus on providing the service and education uh, to strengthen the capacity in digital for women. 
And the other thing is uh, several speakers already mentioned, I'm so glad that it was raised up about child care savers. That's uh, important to, to take into consideration uh, for all of the companies. Uh, it doesn't depend uh, where it is, especially in the rural areas. And also I would just, uh, and the other thing is today we need, um, crucially uh, investment to uh, companies that led by women, especially after the old challenges they had to uh, have before and they are going to have in the future. So we need to plan this and, uh, and assist them on time. And uh, also, as Jana mentioned about the Women's Entrepreneurship Expo that happened last year, and I had chance to participate uh, in this event in Kyrgyzstan and uh, uh, women from rural areas, from different cities participated there. And actually, it showed that uh, this is a good case and where we uh, collect everyone, investors, entrepreneurs, uh, activists, government representatives who can jointly start to uh, think and expand the budget of, in uh, of investment to women's entrepreneurs. Sorry, I, I tried to be short. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Thank you so much. Very important points that you raised and, and, and all the social issues that have been happening in the world throughout this year's pandemic you mentioned. Now the war in Ukraine have affected women entrepreneurs and uh, now we need to support them. Uh, yeah, and, and, and principle five is a great tool for that uh, because we need to integrate uh, these women entrepreneurs back into the supply chains of the bigger companies and support them through different activities. And, and with this, I would like to uh, turn with the second question to Ezra. Um, I would like to ask you, what mechanisms do you use to support women-owned uh, businesses in, in your supply chain? And um, how do you help them, uh, those women entrepreneurs who struggle to access adequate resources to successfully deliver at, as a supplier? Uh, what do you do in this regard? You also have around a minute or a minute and a half. Sorry for this, but we need to keep okay. the time. Okay, so let me thank you. And also I would like to thank to Aldiana. And what I will tell now, I know we'll make all of us who participate to the mm -hmm. panel make happy because we have our one of the proudest achievements, which has brought us also many national and international awards. Uh, a program which we initiated in 2017 uh, named as Technology Power for Women Entrepreneurs. So when we started this program, as you know, we are an e-commerce company uh, with a marketplace operation. So we have many, many merchants. And when we started this program, the percentage of women existing on our platform was 6%. And in uh, four and a half years, four years, number of merchants in the platform increased seven to eight times overall, mm -hmm. overall without a distinction of women and men. Uh, but now the number of percentage, the percentage of women merchants is 24%. So eight wow. times increase of merchants and from 6% to 25, 24, 25% of women entrepreneurs. What we did for this, actually, we didn't stop with the pandemics. Contrary, we continued our efforts with many planned, structured efforts. We are giving, uh, the program offers various opportunities and conveniences to female entrepreneurs, including discounted commission rates, advertising, photo shooting, marketing support, digital marketing, social media existence, uh, shipping discounts, etc., etc. many solid um, things that they can use. And uh, more than that, we continued making, uh, mentoring them and uh, giving courage to exist in an e-commerce platform with their uh, entrepreneurial uh, existence. So we conduct various comprehensive training programs and provide mentorship in 19 areas to support women to further develop themselves and adapt to the changes in the e-commerce and digitalization. And also with the program, we have supported as a result 
more than 29,000 female entrepreneurs, uh, including also more than 110 women's cooperatives, which exist on rural areas in Turkey, especially, and 33 NGOs to date. So this is a journey and you have to give lots of effort and you have to believe it. Uh, and it is one of the core values and reasons that helps brother exist. Uh, the women, uh, not only from employee perspective, but overall ecosystem perspective. Thank you so much, Esra. Very uh, important statistics that you mentioned and congratulations on increasing uh, in, in the last four years. Four years is a very small period of time. Uh, the, the, the number of women entrepreneurs by seven, eight times, it's, it's amazing. And uh, also the, the, the directions that you talked about, uh, um, mentoring women entrepreneurs and increasing their skills uh, uh, in e-commerce e and digitalization, that's very, very important. Uh, because this is the future of the profession and uh, uh, we need to work very hard to also provide the skills to the women entrepreneurs that will help them uh, in, in a long-term perspective to develop their business. Uh, thank you for that. Now I will turn uh, with this next question to Pascal. Uh, Pascal, I would like to ask you, why are inclusive sourcing practices important to your organization? How are you working with your suppliers uh, to promote equality and uh, inclusion? Uh, growth. Uh, can you tell us more about your, your procurement practices and also policies that are in place which are gender sensitive? Um, for our suppliers, what we've done is um, a lot, we're just starting on our, on our journey. So we've done a lot of um, uh, coaching with our suppliers, explaining the importance of um, being certified, for instance, as a, a women owned, etc. But I wanted to, I would like to, to, if you don't mind, to mention something that that I find very special to to our company, and it's what we're doing with our customers. So, uh, as I mentioned, we train pilots, and there's a big, uh, big need to have a uh, there's a big shortage of pilots around the world, and um, uh, only 5% of our customers, 5% uh, of the pilots around the world are women. So what we've done, and uh, I wanted to emphasize it because it's, it's, it's very special, is create a, um, a scholarship for women uh, to become pilots. So what we did is we realized that a lot of um, the, uh, in, in the population today, there aren't, because there aren't so many pilots, there aren't role models. And uh, so a lot of the women are not applying to become pilots because they don't have role, role models. So what we've done is we, um, uh, we created this, uh, this scholarships and uh, we have uh, provided it to six women. And while they are doing their training, they are also ambassadors. So they talk about the pilot career, they talk about it. And this has helped uh, boost uh, our recruitment of, of pilots. We've, we went from like 12% of, um, of the population of, of, uh, of applicants being women to 35%. So I, I wanted to bring that up because I thought it was very special to our, um, to our own company and our, uh, our market in civil aviation. Thank you so much, Pascal. Very, very, very important uh, topic that you just raised, uh, defeating the stereotypes that exist in the women's and men's stereotypically positions as such and professions. And uh, this is very important to tackle the stereotypes during the um, recruitment process, uh, uh, as well as uh, in, inside your company as well and in the communities. And we, we talk now in the marketplace dimension. So I would like to continue what you've said and um, uh, give the floor to Juliet here. So we are talking now about tackling the harmful stereotypes, uh, often through social approval or disapproval st stereotypes affect one's self-confidence and behavior, and um, it precludes women to apply to some of the positions. So what are the measures uh, in place in your organization to protect the mental health of employees and unpack harmful stereotypes? 
It's a, a good question. Thank you. So in the av aviation sector in general, stereotypes are a, a huge is issue. So it's perceived as a male dominated industry and has been um, for a very long time. So challenging those stereotypes is really key to making our organisation more diverse and, and more inclusive. So for us, um, countering that, that stereotype and um, that working in aviation is a man's role is really critical. Representation matters. So for us, there's a big focus on making sure that wherever possible, we're using images and videos um, of lots of the great women that we have working across our company in many of the different roles that they do um, and making sure that people feel that they can see women working in this industry and, and that they can um, understand the different types of roles that can be done regardless of gender. We make sure that all of our colleagues globally go through diversity and inclusion training regularly um, so that they are clear on the impact that their own actions in the workplace could have in, in terms of making sure our, our culture is diverse and is inclusive. And then it's also just some of the basic things to make sure that um, females feel welcome and, and included in our organisations and wherever possible trying not to have only one female working on a particular shift for example, making sure that break rooms and bathrooms and things like that accommodate both genders and, and just generally trying to get some of those basics right and in, in making the, the workplace feel inclusive. Uh, thank you very, thank you very much Asel, very important topics and, and you you've touched the topics of the stereotypes in the aviation now it, it's it's good to move to other sectors as well and i would like to to turn the floor to thomas and natasha um, you come from the maritime and also the telecommunication sectors and another stereotype that is out there uh, is that stem careers are not suited for women while actually in fact uh, over 30 per 35 percent of, of stem graduates globally are actually women so um, um, what are your organizations doing, the companies doing to tackle the stereotypes uh, and um, uh, how, how are you uh, moving forward with uh, uh, giving the visibility to women in the STEM roles? Um, Asel talked about it a bit and how, how do you uh, work on this in your own companies? how you uh, promote women in, in the STEM roles? We, we can start with Thomas, maybe, and then we can turn to Natasha. Oh, I can actually see Natasha wanted to start up, so uh, so sorry for interrupting you, Natasha, but uh, I'll give it, keep it brief then, because what I really think here is uh, important is um, not addressing it uh, directly as STEM roles, it's, a, it's, it's creating awareness actually when you are when you're actually in your family, when you get your kids over, uh, at, at the dinner table, explaining them that you can be everything you want to, that you are, I have three girls, you talk to them as, uh, you know, basically that they can do whatever they want. You don't start by asking them to uh, play soccer uh, or handball or whatever is your own stereotype. You, you, you actually get them to come with their own wishes. I think we have a, uh, an enormous influence uh, to create that awareness very, very early on uh, amongst our employees. Um, that uh, you can do a lot of, at home. Uh, we need to also influence uh, the universities, uh, high schools, uh, come out with them, uh, show good uh, role modeling of uh, what is it that you can actually do. Um, I don't find it actually particularly difficult for the ones who are actually applying, whether it's a man or female uh, for the capability. But what I've seen is that the, the pipeline is simply, it's been a, a, a for lack of better wording, I said a bit under invested by us in actually talking about how early is it actually that we are stereotyping whether you should go in that direction or another direction. Um, and I think we have a, at least a, also being heading an HR function, I need to, to be extremely aware of that. Uh, it's also how I address and how I can see on the participant list that it's uh, primarily I can see a lot of female names uh, at least. Um, so this is also about being extremely good at creating awareness outside of this form. It's what I do every day when I walk into the executive team, when I play soccer, if I do that with the, with the teammates, uh, making sure that I promote whatever opportunity I have for creating like a small, um, 
phrases where we can discuss uh, what does it actually mean uh, to be having equal opportunities and uh, and also uh, uh, you know nudging on that. So I think for the STEM roles, uh, yeah, it depends on where you look at it, but but for sure right now the there is not a huge pipeline. So we are taking whatever markets yeah we can get there. Uh, but but I think it, it, it starts very early on, uh, um, and that's uh, that's my view on it. And then I can leave it to another. Thomas, thank you. I completely agree. We need to start from from the education, from from the very early education, primary education, and then move on to the universities. That's where we we are actually can encourage women to also be represented in the uh, in the STEM. Um, positions and uh, in, in the STEM area and at the same time it's also as you said very important role to work with the HRs in the companies to actually uh, defeat the stereotypes and biases that exist in our societies so Natasha sorry I didn't hear that you you started talking and I uh, excuse me for that but I, I turned to you right now what are you doing in, in, in your company in order to defeat the stereotypes well, and, and promote women in STEM position. Yes, sorry. You mentioned that the 35% uh, of the girls in STEM, I mean, this is a fantastic figure. And I would say, in general, we don't have enough people in STEM area, uh, not just girls, but it's all girls. Croatia is a growing market, so more and more companies are requiring such a knowledge and such a type of education. So what we are trying to promote is that we involve kids from the youngest age uh, even from the primary school uh, to the program we call Generation Now. Uh, we cooperate with about 300 different organizations uh, through the Croatia uh, to basically involve kids uh, from the first grade uh, to, to join different programs with their ideas. Uh, what makes me very happy when we get feedback from such um, ideas and organizations that more and more girls are participating with good ideas from robotics, from uh, programming, uh, from uh, data analytics is there in the high school and so on and so on. So definitely uh, people who will um, contribute to the country's development and hopefully become one of our uh, future employees. Uh, more than 3000 kids uh, joined this program in the last six years with really fantastic ideas. Um, at the end of the day, uh, for us as employee, employers, uh, it's always the best candidate should win but definitely uh, we are very happy to hear more and more girls are joining this program. Uh, what we are also trying to uh, promote and talk a lot about uh, in our society is that you as a, as a woman can do both. You can be a highly positioned manager and you can still be mom and wife and, and have a normal life. Uh, so colleagues uh, are organizing a lot of different activities in the media, through the portal, social media, television shows. Uh, where we have opportunity to talk how we are doing that, that everything is possible, that nobody should be scared. And at the end of the day, it's a uh, it's, um, future, I, I would say, that these type of jobs are future. Uh, so um, we are definitely hoping that more and more girls will then join, uh, more than 35% that we are going to do. Thank you, Natasha. I completely agree. It starts from the from the very, very beginning and, and the, the great job that you're doing in promoting the STEM positions in, in the school level, a very important uh, steps that you're making. Uh, I think we need to uh, get to the last question. Uh, and uh, David, I would like to ask you this question. We talked about defeating stereotypes, including women entrepreneurs into the value chain. And another important direction that the uh, principle five is uh, directed as is uh, to promote uh, um, uh, uh, the use of gender inclusive language in internal and external communications. How have your organization approached this issue? Thank you for the question. Um, for FCC, we, we are currently in the, pro in the process of designing and drafting an, an inclusive language manual uh, applicable all, all, to all the company, working on uh, so hard to finally be able to include uh, all language and all the sensitive, sensitive, sensitivities, sorry, of the different groups. For example, we we have created great uh, a virtual entity with the vendor uh, that we allow 
us to explain the company code of ethics and conduct uh, to employees. In conclusion, is, uh, it is uh, the, the, the most important things to include the language as a key piece of the gender sensitivity. Speaking, we, we spread concept and make it possible for everyone to belong in our activity and feel identified identify with, it, with it, okay? Uh, thank you very much, David. It was important to also touch upon this topic of communication and uh, great job that you are doing in your company. Now I would like to thank all of the distinguished speakers uh, um, for a very interesting discussion. And I would like to pass floor back to Dan to conclude this session. Well, thank you so much, Salome, and well done uh, to you and Annabella for moderating two really interesting panels. And thank you to all our panelists for sharing your insights, being so transparent about the challenges that you're facing in your work to increase gender equality in, in business. We've, we've certainly all learned a lot from the challenges, but also the opportunities in industries that are traditionally male dominated. I was shocked to learn that only 5% of airline pilots are women. I thought in 2022, it was a much higher number. Um, what I did hear also loud and clear from many of the speakers today were three things. It makes business sense to get serious about women's leadership through measurable targets and actions. There's only upside here. Uh, key to success is engaging male leaders and colleagues from the very beginning. Uh, male champions, it was great to hear the, the male colleagues uh, joining us and, and their insights, really important. And thirdly, we've got a long way to go to break down the stereotypes, but male-dominated industries can play a leading role in advancing women in, in STEM. So thank you to all our speakers for your insightful contributions. Thank you to all of you in our audience today for your participation and engagement. Uh, we hope that you've heard uh, uh, what you've heard today will inspire your professional journey and your leadership as champions for gender equality. Before we wrap up, I'd also like to reiterate the UN Global Compact stands with the UN and world leaders in expressing our deep concern about the ongoing war in Ukraine and the unequivocal demand for peace. To take immediate action to support humanitarian relief efforts, we've produced a guide that explains how businesses can support the Secretary General's three-month flash appeal for people in Ukraine and a regional refugee response plan. The UN Global Compact calls on principal business leaders around the world to renew and amplify their commitment to peace and support the people of Ukraine. As we all know, civilians, including women and children, often suffer most as a result of conflict. They pay a grave price for something they play no part in. At the same time, overwhelming evidence points to the fact that women's participation and leadership can strengthen peace agreements, societies, and economies. With this call to action, I'd like to thank again everyone for your participation today, and of course to the UN Economic Commission for Europe and UN Women for your collaboration in discussing this important topic. We wish the UN Economic Commission for Europe all the best with the rest of the forum's activities. Thank you all for joining us. And until we meet again next time, goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.